first of all, thank you for uh, the opportunity to participate in this session. It's so interesting to see the range of things that are being done around campus and then even within our smaller uh, universe. I'm going to be talking about digital storytelling and immersive media. I subtitled it Computational Humanities Practice to make it clear that that's where we are. And um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, contextual framing, and you'll see why in a minute. So my interests are really in the intersection of, of digital humanities and computational media together. And some of the work is related to digital cultural heritage and archives and thinking about different ways to make them accessible, how to think about different modalities, um, and to think about new modes of communication, research and interpretation. And then part of that is about immersive and interactive media for storytelling, which includes the web, XR and games. And some of that is on the creative side and some of it is really designed to be used in some of these digital cultural heritage types of applications. And then finally, I also have this strong interest in critical media and technology studies, media histories, and social and cultural studies. So trying to step back from all of this and think about the questions of just because we can, does that mean we should, and what happens when we do, and also the survivals of earlier media forms in relation to new ones. So again, as I said, I'm gonna be talking about immersive and interactive media for storytelling. Um, and the second sort of note to make is that as a member of art, art history and visual studies, um, but also as a graduate director and undergraduate director, I'm really trying to find ways to bring together communities of scholars, faculty, staff, students, other community members um, to do this type of work together. So I'll be talking about two projects today. The first one is called Visualizing Lovecraft's Providence. So this is H.P. Uh, Lovecraft, the famous uh, early 20th century writer of tales of somewhat Gothic horror. Um, and our question here is how do we historically reconstruct an imagined world and how virtual reconstruction of an imagined world creates new spaces for interpretation and critique. So we're really interested in thinking about how to take the technologies of historical and cultural visualization and apply them to imagined spaces and places uh, in works that were really relying upon the, the real uh, places and spaces in order to create their effects. Lots of critics have written about Lovecraft's work and artists have been inspired by it to create new media, including, you know, video games and novels and um, TV series. Um, there's also a lot of fan art. Um, but here our interest is really in foregrounding the interrelations of space, place and story through this active process of reconstructive effective places and spaces. 11 minutes before. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, so Lovecraft famously declared, I am Providence, it's an epitaph inscribed on his tombstone, and with his detailed descriptions of the city streets vanished in current architectures and interiors, um, we really get a lot of uh, material to work with in trying to think about how to create historical reconstructions. Uh, part of what's interesting in this challenge, too, is thinking about how we deal with ambiguity uh, in the descriptions that he gives us, as well as the specificity for imagined places and how those two things will intersect with real world environments. So this is just a short text um, is, is an example of a character in the novel of Charles Dexter Ward. Um, it's a short, short novel set in 1928, and it describes how this character, Charles Dexter, Dexter Ward, becomes obsessed with a distant ancestor. Joseph Kerwin, who's an alleged 18th century wizard. Um, and a part of the story involves uh, Charles Dexter Ward, Ten a young minutes man, before. wandering through the city and understanding uh, what we can get from his movements through the city. So this map on the right here is a map of College Hill, the area surrounding Brown that already has within it embedded a lot of the famous places of the Lovecraftian universe. But then here we're trying to think about how to take a text like this um, that describes in great detail, I'll just read a little bit, further and further down that almost perpendicular hill he would venture, each time reaching older and quainter levels of the ancient city, he would hesitate gingerly down vertical Jenke Street with its bank walls and colonial gables to the shady Benefit Street corner, where before him was a wooden antique with an ionic pilastered pair of doorways, and beside him a prehistoric gambrel roofer with a bit of primal farmyard remaining. You know, so there's a lot of very specific architectural detail and locational detail that's embedded within the text. And part of what we're trying to do is think about how to unpack that to see to what extent that's referencing the real, to what extent it's an imaginary space, and how working with historical archives and materials can help us to appreciate that. So this also involves mapping some of these spaces and places. Um, you know, initially this map is of 
specifically Charles Dexter Ward, but part of the idea is to think about how we can map some of the other tales that Lovecraft put into the context of Providence and to think about how we can create a, a spatial universe, Lovecraftian universe that we can occupy as readers, as viewers, and potentially also as individuals moving through the city itself. So in a way, this is a, a kind of distant reading of the oeuvre of Lovecraft from the perspective of space. And of course, again, this involves going into historical materials and archives using the tools of digital art history, but in a new way in order to understand the relationships between space, place, time, and the effects that are being created by Lovecraft. Uh, we're working at the scale of individual structures and of the city and also of the area, also incorporating 3D models, um, layered and annotated 2D maps like you see here, and ultimately uh, immersive and interactive XR experiences as well. So we're interested in unpacking how Lovecraft created the effects in part by trying to invoke them in transmedia forms. So some of what's happening here is that there's this quasi-scientific way of engaging with the work, but we're also interested in its affective and experiential dimensions and how we can try to reproduce, reinterpret, or transform them through the work that we're doing here. So it's a dialogue, it's in conversation with the primary text, but not necessarily expecting to be only an illustration of it, but something that's an additional layer of interpretation. And in the process, part of what we're doing is drawing out some of the latent imagery of the complex spaces that are alluded to. This diagram is a diagram of a basement where Charles Dexter Ward ultimately finds himself in a, a really tense scene. Um, and only by reading the text in great detail do we come to understand the shape and the symbology that's here. So some of it is wondering about uh, it's a reverse engineering in a way of the Lovecraftian imagination, but it's also helping us to bring forward aspects that may be more latent in our interpretations of the text. And by, as I said, by re-examining these spatial and temporal building blocks, we want to gain a deeper insight into the recurring tropes of the writing, revealing the architecture of his mind and early 20th century worldview, and maybe conjuring this wider landscape of the life world that he's created. We also want to create on-site experiences in the city of Providence, as well as other types of explorations, taking lessons from critical cartography, Bactinian chronotopes, theories of urbanism and psychogeography and affective experience design, as well as prior art in the field to create these multimodal interpretations. And, you know, I want to add that this is not meant to be an uncritical or slavish adaptation, but one that we highlights how these spatially inflected aspects of, of the Lovecraftian imagination work. And also how they, this act of reimagining enables us to see Lovecraft seeing and experiencing the city he so identified with. And we do hope that the final project provides the interactor engaged with the space, both an immersive experience built upon the Lovecraftian world, but also some agency in traversing and examining it and in um, having a simultaneously critical distance and immersive experience uh, in their engagement with this environment. So the second project I just wanted to mention is one that's more explicitly in the game world. And this particular project is using many of the same tools, but for slightly different effects. So I have a longstanding collaboration with a colleague, Joyce Rudinsky, uh, who is a new media artist at UNC, and we've created a number of artist games. Our latest is called Psychosthenia 4 Insomnia, and it explores how video game conventions and technologies can be created, uh, be used to create new kinds of installation art. At the same time, our projects reflect upon and forecast future uses of the technology for psychological and social manipulation and control. Um, for us, the growth of games, gamification, and related technologies has extended far beyond the realm of art and entertainment and deep into education, governance, politics, and every aspect of society, especially for us, psychology and uh, personal uh, health. So what we wanna do is blur these boundaries between appreciating creative possibilities and critiquing their use in digital surveillance and quantification by creating experiences that inhabit the game world at the same time as they critique. It. So you see a similar sort of theme to what we're trying to do in the Lovecraft project. Users in our games are set to be unsure if they're ultimately guinea pigs in a psychological experiment or co-creators of an immersive interactive experience. And sometimes we've heightened that ambiguity by wearing white coats at installations and such. So I'm going to turn you over briefly to Dr. Carl, who's going to tell you what's about to happen to you. There's Dr. Carl. He is a recurring character who is in a new form here in this particular game. Hello, I am Dr. Carl, Jr. I see you wish to become unconscious. A laudable ambition. 
and vital to your daytime value to society. Fortunately for you, I have engineered a revolutionary, immersive bedroom experience. My innovative intervention can hack your dreams, enabling your quest towards lucidity and control over your unconscious state. First, you must adjust the patented system settings in order to find your perfect nighttime balance. But be careful. Push too far, each option might produce an unfortunate effect. My embedded intelligent agents will then guide you on your dream journey. You will need to endure this, strive, and cope with adversity, if you hope to achieve the fleeting bliss of a contented repose. All right, so when you enter the game world, Dr. Carl sets you on your way, and I'm not going to go through the whole thing, um, but I'll tell you a little bit about some of the key features here. As the intro suggests, our goal is to take you on a techno-mediated heroic journey towards the elusive goal of a good night's sleep. The pursuit of self-care in an age of social, ecological, and political anxiety here becomes a quest for agency and self-determination needed for peaceful repose. Like other games in our series, we explore psychotherapeutic interventions as a cultural phenomenon and dysfunction as something that's being both produced and diagnosed and experienced through the system, which and ultimately could perhaps be more harm than help. And in this case, we wanted to take our interest in data analysis and logging that we had explored in prior games for the living daytime world um, and turn it inward and to explore what happens when we, when we begin colonizing the world of sleep and dreams through instrumentation and to think about how these technologies control maintenance and self-programming and biohacking can affect our psychic lives. So it's not only the computerized tests, social media, dark patterns and recommendation systems of daily life that we're interested in, but the ways in which we might be striving in the future to turn them upon our unconscious selves in the world of sleep and dreams. We also wanted to push further on the idea that there's no inside or outside to the layers of consciousness, especially when you're operating in a system where you're trying to expose your unconscious to these hacks. Uh, neuroplastic triggers, binaural beats, and digital tweaks of the idea of medication are blurring the boundaries here. And we're imagining the world where something is put under your pillow, um, like in Charlie Brown, but it's actually getting into your head. So in our dream world, interactions correlate with themes of repeated re-experience of trauma, engagement with psychic and, and social burdens and anxieties, and the need to negotiate external demands for your attention. All of this is based on the literature of sleep and dreams from scientific, psychological, and self-help perspectives. Periodic microdreams interrupt the flow of your nighttime reveries um, and mimic the experience of sleeping. Within the dream world, you do have some ability to choose from amongst potential triggers, each symbolic in its own right, and taking you into dreams that tease you with these moments of angst, futility, and disempowerment that are so interrupting your sleep, coupled with the enigmatic commentary from the collective unconscious in the form of these uh, agents who are guiding you on your way. So of course, the idea of hacking your, uh, your subconscious is not new in itself, and we highlight that by drawing upon historic symbology and occult divination practices in the dream spaces that we evoke. The surreal landscapes are fueled by technologies of wellness where you program your night with some intermittent success as you go on. Over time, the project itself moves us away from everyday environments and past trauma into more expressive spaces and interactions as you approach the glories of deeper sleep. In times, keeping with the nature of sleep and dreams, however, you bounce in and out, and rather than being in a singular progression, it goes back and forth in the cyclic movement that mimics sleep. As we imagine how the data-driven managed avatar self manifests as both a social entity and an interiorized state of being, we're left wondering about whether there is a qualitative difference between a digitally mediated self-perception and one produced through earlier technologies of representation and control as they've developed in society over time. As a Victorian novel scholar by training, I always think about the ways people were so upset about novels and their deleterious effects upon the psyche of impressionable young women. As we venture into collaborative, hybrid, alg algorithmically driven understandings of ourselves and our collective self-fashioning, these distinctions may matter less as biology and psyche become instrumented and managed states of being subject to calibration, automation, and control. As we continue on with this project and develop VR and AR versions, we want to also explore the, uh, the different elements and resonances that come from each of these types of media forms as well. So as I said, um, the core interests are in humanities and computations intersecting, but coming into the larger context that we'll hear about from uh, Ed in a moment in the world of digital cultural heritage. You know, one of the things that's really distinctive about 
our community is that we have people engaged in all these kinds of topics and crossing over with each other and collaborating with each other. Um, very brief shout out to a presentation Joyce and I will be doing on artist games, critical and creative approaches to new media art. You're invited to apply if you like. Um, we will be having lightning talks on March 25th for people who do choose to apply. And in the meantime, thank you from me and from all of the different groups and units that I work with, many of which uh, Augustus called out at the beginning. Thanks.